It seems that for millennia, human societies in all parts of the earth have pondered the question of what happens to a person after death. Is death the terminator of both physical life and human consciousness? Or does, in some way, a non-physical conscious entity of the person survive the death of the body? From earliest times, whether they buried pots of food and a spear with the deceased tribesmen, or created intricate entombments in great civilizations, human beings have believed that a non-physical or spiritual portion of the person would survive death. Different ancient cultures accommodated this concept in various ways. Some even believed that the physical body, or some portion of it, had to be preserved in order for the spirit to continue to live and function. Ancient Egypt provides a well-known case in point. This society took the preservation and protection of the body to unparalleled levels. A great portion of the wealth of the Egyptian empire was focused to this end. A person, they believed, consisted of a physical body, and not one, but two souls that lived on after death, the Ka soul and the Ba soul. The Ka was said to be a spirit replica of the person, containing the vital force received at birth. It would dwell in the statue or picture of the dead person placed in the grave for this purpose. The Ba was the part of the person that had the potential to enjoy an eternal life and peace if accepted by the gods. The Ba was thought to return to the burial site to enjoy food and drink offerings left by family or admirers. The body, however, had to continue to be recognizable to allow the Ba to return to it. Hence, they gradually mastered the art of embalming. Anything that might cause the body to decay, like internal organs, was removed and placed in jars. But the heart, which was the seat of life in their minds, was preserved and placed in the body. They felt that damaging a heart could result in a second death of the Ka. The body was dehydrated and stuffed, then preserved with chemicals of the day. The Egyptian priest, adorned with a jackal mask, would then perform the last rites, which included causing the mouth to be opened, thus enabling speaking and eating in the afterlife. The whole process took 70 days. Much of the wealth and skill base of the Egyptian empire was consumed by a religion which was effectively a cult of death. Today, many in our society claim to have no interest or belief in religion and readily dismiss the idea of an afterlife. Of course, opinion on the matter may shift a bit with age or illness, as one's apparent mortality becomes more obvious. Almost all people will at one point ponder the question, what happens when I die? Have you ever asked that question? I think you have. Most religions have some sort of answer, but on what is it based? Some may claim they predicate their belief on a text called the Bible. Most people, however, are actually surprised to find that what the Bible actually does say on the topic varies considerably from what most people assume it says. Stay tuned as we answer the question, which one day we will certainly all ask, what happens when I die? Today we are examining the much-considered question, what happens when you die? In truth, there have been and currently are many varying ideas and positions about death and its consequences. Some will have a more pragmatic or atheistic approach, see death as the end of one's existence. The person dies, and that's the end of them from both a physical and mental awareness perspective. Some of Eastern orientations believe that while the body may die, the spiritual essence of the body gets reincarnated into another living thing, human or animal. Some feel this cycle of birth and death continues until they achieve perfection and escape the wheel of life into blissful non-existence. Still others of more Middle Eastern or Western traditions hold that the human body is home to a non-physical entity that some call a soul 
This soul, they believe, leaves the body upon death and subject to a judgment by God is assigned an eternal reward in a heavenly realm or sentenced to an eternity of pain, sorrow and suffering in hell. Much of both the Western and Eastern beliefs originated in ancient Mesopotamia. The ideas that came from this region spread later to Egypt and the East and also impacted the belief structures of Greece and Rome. According to historians, the ancient Mesopotamians believed humans were created from clay mixed with the blood of a sacrifice god. Thus, being partly immortal, the spirit did not die after death but lingered on to suffer a dismal afterlife. The only respite from this existence was the food and offerings of their descendants. The dead could return at times and wreak havoc upon their neglectful descendants if not provided with a proper burial and offerings. This theme was modified over time in the different cultures to which such ideas spread. Hence the development of ancestor worship along with the need to placate the dead. In the Western world, such concepts were imported by the Greeks and their Roman students. Roman religious ideas were extensively borrowed from the Greeks. The Greek religious and cultural ideas were spread to many regions through the expansion of the Greek Empire in the days of Alexander and his successors. Not dissimilar from the Mesopotamians, both Romans and Greeks believed in a god or gods of the underworld, Hades in Greek and Pluto to the Romans. After death, souls would give an account of their lives to three judges and be consigned either to the fields of Ashvedel or the pit of Tartarus. In some literature, if a soul had been exceptionally good, it might go to Elysium or the Isles of the Blessed, a place usually reserved for heroes and the gods. Elysium was described as a beautiful place, usually reserved only for war heroes and the gods. The fields of Ashvedel are described by Homer as a realm of Hades, which is a dark and gloomy place where regular mortals wander, wailing, lost and aimless. In the pit of Tartarus. According to Plato, wicked souls judged to be curable were purified in Tartarus. The souls of those who were judged curable would eventually be released from Tartarus. The souls of those considered incurable were eternally damned. It is well known to historians that religious ideas of various cultures were often accepted by the Israelites of the biblical record. When the Greeks absorbed Judea into their empire around 330 BC, and when Alexander showed great favor to the Jews, many Jews settled in his new city of Alexandria. A process of Hellenization swept over the Jews of the day, and many adopted Greek clothing, lifestyle, architecture, and even aspects of their philosophy and religion. This set the stage for the confrontation between Jewish leaders of various religious factions, with the party of the Sadducees accepting much Greek culture, which affected their view of what happens to the dead. Greek thought greatly impacted the religious life of many in Judea, including at the time of Christ. What many well-meaning religions teach today about what occurs upon death has often been more influenced by Greco-Roman ideas of religion than by the Bible. You may indeed be surprised to learn how these ancient ideas have impacted how people who identify as Christians view the whole subject of death and an afterlife. Today, we are very pleased to offer one of the most concise explanations of this whole subject, a booklet authored by longtime broadcaster and student of the Bible, Richard Ames. It is entitled, What Happens When You Die? The answer is provided from the actual biblical text, not influenced by the cultural traditions and ideas of man. You may be very well surprised by the actual answer to the question. It is likely much different than that which you have heard before. So far we have very briefly examined some of the concepts mankind has developed that have shaped the views of many cultures and religions on the matter of what happens to a person after death. Could it be 
that some of these ideas of ancient pre-Christian cultures actually influenced and even shaped some of the notions prevalent in some faiths today that identify as Christian? Let us start by examining the most common beliefs of professing Christianity and see if they are compatible with the document upon which their faith is supposedly based, that document being the Bible. What is the majority, though not universally held, position on the part of professing Christianity on the matter of death and the afterlife today? With a number of variations, they believe that a human being is host to an immortal spiritual entity called the soul, which resides in the body, but is separate from it. The soul departs from the body upon death. The soul immediately receives a judgment from God based upon some criteria. It is then assigned to an eternity of bliss in heaven or is judged wanting and condemned to eternal suffering and torment in a place called hell, not unlike the Greek Tartarus. Are these teachings actually found in the Bible? Most adherents are convinced they are, but let's see what the Bible actually says. Let us first examine the matter of a soul. Dr. Philip Allman, Professor of Humanities at the University of Queensland, writing for the BBC History magazine, states this. From the beginning of the third century, the Christian tradition adopted the Greek tradition that individuals were composed of a mortal body and an immortal soul. In other words, Allman is stating that prior to the third century AD, this was not the opinion of the early Christian church. As we will see, the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments taught something very different. Augustine held to be one of the greatest influencers of the Roman church from AD 354 to 430, actually fused the religion of the New Testament with the tradition of Greek philosophy as exemplified by Plato. Another great Christian writer was Tertullian, who openly admits his authority is not biblical, but from Plato. For some things are known even by nature. The immortality of the soul, for instance, is held by many. I may use, therefore, the opinion of Plato when he declares every soul is immortal. We notice Plato is the primary authority here, not the Bible. Interestingly, perhaps shocking to some, is to find that one person who objected to this position was German reformer Martin Luther. He commented, It is probable, in my opinion, that with very few exceptions indeed, the death sleep in utter insensibility till the day of judgment. On what authority can it be said that the souls of the dead may not sleep? In the same way that the living pass in profound slumber the interval between their downlying at night and their uprising in the morning. Does the Bible support the notion that each person has an immortal soul that survives death and wafts off to heaven or descends into hell? Our special offer today will provide a much more detailed answer. But let's just look at a few simple scriptures that seem to be rather straightforward. The Bible clearly calls man a soul in some English translations. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now we can note that in the New King James, where they have updated the meaning of the words, used in the 1611 authorized version, it reads a little differently. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Why is the word soul used in one version and being in another? Both words are translated from the Hebrew term nephesh. This is a term used for a living physical creature. The same word nephesh is used for created animals in Genesis 1, verse 24. And then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature, nephesh, according to its kind, cattle and creeping things, 
and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. As we can see, the term translated as the word soul in Genesis 2 verse 7 means a living creature. The word nephesh can even refer to the dead body of a person. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body, nephesh, touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Thus it appears that the use of the term nephesh when translated soul does not refer to immortality. Ezekiel was also inspired to write a warning to the person who willfully sins without the intention of changing. In Ezekiel 18 verse 4 and repeated in verse 18, we find that the soul can die. Behold, all souls, nephesh, are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Clearly then, the Bible contradicts popular present-day doctrine. The Apostle Paul made the point in the latter part of his ministry that Jesus Christ was the only man who ever attained immortality. That you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Paul was stating that Jesus is immortal, but that mankind does not have immortality in any way. Earlier, in fact, while he was yet on earth, Jesus made the very clear statement that no human had ever gone to heaven except for himself. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man. Jesus was maintaining that none of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as men like David and the prophets, had gone to heaven. He was saying they were all dead. Now, they do have a great hope and promise but they have not received it yet, as the Bible indicates. Who are we to believe then? The word of Jesus Christ, whose teachings we purport to follow, who said that no human had ever gone to heaven, or the word of human religionists who contradict his word? The biblical text is actually quite consistent on this point, asserting that immortality is a particular gift of God to be granted at a future time and according to certain conditions. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Scripture clearly states the wages or ultimate consequence of unrepented sin, violation of God's law, is death. Death is the absence of life. It is not some time of eternal life of suffering. Indeed, if one already has an immortal soul, one already has eternal life, which is a clear and direct contradiction of the words of Jesus Christ and the apostles. Now, to be clear, the Bible does speak of a spirit in man, which is not a soul, but rather a spirit from God that empowers our intellect. Every newborn child is in possession of this spirit of intellect or spirit in man enabling us to think reason, create, and be self-aware. It gives us abilities no animal can have. Upon our death, this power of intellect returns to God, who has his own mental record of each human who has ever lived, which record he will use in the future. But upon our death, that spirit energy has no consciousness. Note the Bible's statement on this. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. This can seem very depressing, but that depressing end can be readily avoided, as there is also a promise of future life, one which can be eternally happy, creative, and incredibly productive. That I will cover in the final part of today's program. During the break, 
please take time to acquire our complimentary booklet on the subject, What Happens When You Die? This will cover the subject in much more detail, including answering questions about scriptures which are often incorrectly used to show we have eternal life already. We have seen that when the Bible is consulted on the question of whether we harbor an immortal soul, the answer from the scriptures is clear. No, we do not. Centuries of tradition have been built on the writings of philosophers, which in many cases are used to override the Bible itself. The Sadducees in Paul's day likely had accepted the Greek idea of inherent immortality in humans, but Paul had not. And this division was used by Paul to save his life. When he was put on trial by the combined forces of Pharisees and Sadducees, Paul made a statement to the mob. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Paul believed in the teaching that there would be a resurrection of the dead for him and all the true followers of God through the ages. Life and consciousness would be restored through a resurrection. This he made plain many times, but nowhere more clearly than in his letter to the Corinthian church. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality." Paul states several things here. First, that a person composed of flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. He also says at the time of the trumpet, referring to the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11.15, the dead who had submitted to God would be raised to eternal life and those who are living and obedient at that time would be changed into immortal spirit life. Immortality is something we do not have, that God through Jesus Christ must give to us. But what about the multiple billions of human beings who have lived through the ages who never heard of Jesus Christ, who had lived their life in ignorance of God's law and way of life? Are they lost? Those billions were mortal. They died, they ceased to have existence, yet they too still have a hope of life. Jesus said something to his disciples that people find hard to accept. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is a remarkable truth, showing that no human being can convert another. It is impossible unless God the Father causes the person's mind to be open to accept God's knowledge. God is not calling everyone at the same time, but all will have a chance. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. To come to the truth, the dead who died without truth will have to come to life. Note the remarkable statement given to John in Revelation. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. There is a resurrection of the dead when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom on the earth and to rule here with the resurrected faithful who had been called in their lifetime. But 1,000 years later, there is a second resurrection to physical life to provide opportunity for all the billions of humans who have ever lived to learn and build the character needed to be granted eternal life in God's kingdom. What happens when a person dies? They die. They cease to have awareness or any ability. 
They have no consciousness until such a time as God the Father and Jesus Christ raise them from the dead to an opportunity so great it is indescribable. Long ago, a rebellious spirit being, in order to lead humanity astray, started a false doctrine at the very beginning of man's sojourn on this planet. Lucifer, or Satan, the adversary, spoke to Eve while she was still in the garden and propagated a false doctrine. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Satan lied. He told her she was not going to die, no matter what. In fact, that she was immortal, or possessed an immortal spirit. That deception has been going on since the beginning. You do not have to be deceived. You can have a great future if you accept it. Our free booklet, What Happens When You Die, goes into more detail and answers more questions, such as, what is the fate of the wicked? You will see from the Bible that God has no plan to torture people forever in a place of torment. Please call and ask for today's free offer, and be sure to watch us again next week, joining Gerald Weston, Michael Haycoop, and me as we bring you truth about tomorrow's world.